Good morning to our attendees. We have three in Zoom. Thank you for coming. We're just waiting a little bit uh, for more people to come in. So we are also live on YouTube through bit.ly slash taking place UPB live. All right, so I think we can start. Let's start. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this virtual colloquium and book launch for Indigenous futures and learnings taking place. My name is Paola Pamento Anriva, and I'm from the Cordillera Study Center of the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and I will be the moderator for today's event. We are very thankful and happy to be hosting this event. Um, uh, of this international publication. And to welcome us all to our book launch, I'd like to call on uh, Director Ruth Tindaan of the Cordillera Study Center. Hello, good morning. It's a sunny day in Baguio City where we are. And I'm very happy to welcome all the participants to this virtual launch of the book Indigenous Futures and Learnings Taking Place. I think it's very opportune that we are hosting this event because at the moment we are uh, discussing the setting up of our Indigenous Studies program, a PhD program. And so we are very happy to make this connection with the authors and editors of this publication. So I guess it's going to be a great start for making this network of uh, scholars working in Indigenous Studies. So welcome to all participants and good morning. Thank you, Director Tindaran. And now to welcome everybody officially to the webinar and to introduce our panel of speakers, uh, I would like to call on Licho Lopez Lopez. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, everyone. And thank you for your presence here today. My name is Ligia or Licho Lopez Lopez, and um, I am an academic at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, before we begin, let's make sure that we uh, get some of the logistics sorted in terms of the platform. So this is a Zoom webinar, and we are also um, streaming from YouTube. Um, Behind the scenes, for some of you, uh, uh, or perhaps all of you, um, there are a few of us um, here. Uh, you can probably not see all of us just yet, uh, just me for the time being. Um, there, um, in our time together, will be a, a Q&A uh, time at the end. Um, we are uh, going to be using the Q&A function uh, on uh, Zoom at the bottom uh, for all of your um, questions or comments, and um, you are welcome to um, do so as well on YouTube at any point during the presentation. Uh, the host will uh, make sure that we get the questions and the comments uh, so that we can sort of address those uh, towards the end of our time together. Your microphones have been uh, switched off. Um, from the time you entered. And so we won't be able to hear your voice, but we will be able to read uh, your voice in words uh, as you communicate with us via the Q&A function. Um, now, uh, this um, event would be certainly more uh, um, intimate and warm had we been in the flesh, but uh, at the same time, uh, the, the, the virtual is allowing us to connect with people um, across geographies and we are quite thankful for that and to be able to do that in a synchronous manner. Um, so, uh, so thanks for the technology uh, for making that possible. Okay, hopefully people can hear me okay and if not, they can also let us know. Um, so we're going to uh, now properly begin, and we're going to begin with country, uh, written with a capital C in Australia. We begin by acknowledging the country uh, on which I um, am situated. So country for um, Aboriginal Australia is a word in Aboriginal English, which includes not just the territorial land-based notion of homeland, but also encompasses humans or rather people as well as waters, seas and all that is tangible and intangible. 
and which become together in a mutual in, in mutually um, caring way and in a multi-directional manner to create and nurture a homeland. Uh, I am quoting uh, a group of, of scholars who are also writing with country being an author in the production of the piece from which this uh, quote comes from. So the country from which I speak, uh, where I live and learn, and where I remain an uninvited guest is Wurundjeri. This place um, has uh, been cared for by Aboriginal custodianship for over 65,000 years. Um, I am, as I said, an uninvited guest that um, comes to these lands from uh, other stolen lands uh, at the shores of the Caribbean and also uh, by, the sea, by the banks of the Sinu River uh, in the northern part of Abiyala, also known as Colombia in Latin America. This gathering is facilitated um, uh, by the University of the Philippines in Baguio among the Cordilleras. And these lands are of the Ivaloi peoples, uh, the Igorot more broadly, and the Cordillerans. This gathering is also taking place in the digital, and it is enabled by Zoom, uh, whose operations are made possible while situated on Mukwegma Oklone lands in what is colonially known as San Jose, California. So we want to thank uh, the Cordillera Center at UPB for providing this uh, generous space to share knowledge. And we thank you all for taking a moment of your uh, precious morning uh, in the case of, of the Philippines in these intensified times to be in conversations with us about indigenous futures and learnings taking place. A collection of chapters where the relational matters, where time is uh, revisable and where indigenous matters are dialogical and generative. I will say a little bit more about uh, the substance of the book momentarily, but to situate ourselves, Indigenous Futures and Learnings Taking Place is a collection of writings by women. Indigenous, some of us, Indigenous of Indigenous backgrounds, uh, some of us, and also co-conspirators committed to indigenous struggles. Three of the contributors are with us today, and two of them are writing from Southeast Asia. Today is a celebration of the emergence of this volume into the world and the meanings embedded in the tales that each of the chapters tells. Um, so we are here to talk about time or rather breaking futures out of time. Indigenous futures and learning taking place is a collaborative enraged response against the Greek god Cronus in a calculated escape from chronological time and its urge to plan existences. So I'll say a little bit more about the book in relationship to time before I introduce um, the rest of the panel and uh, the special guests that we have today. With ESCAPE, we are invoking the maroon legacies of my ancestors in the Caribbean to chart a fuga, an escape uh, from the societies of now, which invoke Cronus in the descriptive statements that characterize children as being or falling behind. We do um, not really have to look that far in these pandemic times to look at the frenzy of governments and adults uh, trying to, to think about how it is that poor kids anywhere in the world are um, falling behind due to, and you may fill in the blank, lack of access to face-to-face -face instruction, um, lack of access to technology, and of course, time. So the idea that indigenous people continue to be made as backward and in quotation marks for those who might not be able to, to see this, in need of developing, development, again in quotations, and in need of intervention, again in quotations, are reasoned through chronological modes of timing that attempt to contain, restrain, and restrict being in time. Time orders education in fundamental ways, not only because, school because of school calendars, class and testing schedules, but importantly, because education is meant as a way to change the person and equip them for times to come. This is clear in schooling systems, which are linked to the production of future citizens and societies. 
That kind of time regime plans and anticipates people into entanglements of values to face the uncertainties and the fears slash hopes of societies. Anticipatory regimes abide in the ontology of the not yet. Thus, anticipating implies a, an, an orientation of the self to inhabit time out of place by knowing that which has not yet become. That is, anticipation implies a performative process of rendering futures actionable. In the case of schooling, students become actionable domains as future citizens or actors to reproduce society and ensure security to the kind uh, of life that is valued. So that actionable domain is activated on the basis of data, predictive curricula, testing, educational policy, to intervene in the learning experiences of um, the lives of people. The school and subject within this regime becomes a target of multi-governmental level algorithmic decision-making and the instrument for avoiding risks and enhancing the possibilities of the self for human capital. However, anticipation does not need to be determined by reducing risks to the moral expectations of some and the instrumentalizing of life for another's power and profit. Anticipation can be critical engagement with time to break with teleological thinking by opening the um, relationship and perspectives of time in many of the instances uh, that disrupt this linear progression between learning and becoming. So we are gathered here under the banner Beyond Human, Dreamings of Futures. And this could not be a more opportune moment um, in this uh, what I'm calling anthropocenic era, uh, to imagine futures beyond dispossession and loss, the loss of life in the streets of Myanmar or the Brazilian Amazon. This is an opportune moment for dreaming futures outside displacement in the lands of the Obomanobo and the geographies of Mindanao. Beyond Human calls for a re-engaging of the turns that biocentrically threaten the plotting of life as indigenous in more expansive terms, outside of human and indeed outside of the logic that centers the human itself. So what Gioconda Coelho, Nicole Tuman, and Grace Simulan will do is offer propositions, signposts, plots to continue narrating these times and times to come otherwise. Now, to our speakers. At this point, I'd like to present uh, the brilliant writers and also the two special guests who will be helping us launch our book and also offer some insights on how to engage with uh, the worlds that the book seeks to build. First, we have my co-editor and writer exceptional, Gioconda Coelho. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Gioconda, or Gio, as we call her, is uh, no foreigner to Southeast Asia. She has spent significant time being and thinking in Thailand, among other places in the region. Her research is interdisciplinary and looks at the history of ideas in education and their relation to the politics of being indigenous, brown, and black lives and environmental education in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Nicole is of Southeast Asia. Myanmar and um, Myanmar in particular, and is currently situated in Turtle Island, just as Gioconda is, and also Nicole, and, and also Grace, sorry. She, Nicole, is an independent researcher of environmental and society, um, environment and society in Myanmar, and holds a master's of science in environmental resources from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Grace is of the Philippines and a documentary filmmaker whose work has been uh, screened uh, throughout the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, and China. Her uh, first feature film appeared in CNN Philippines, uh, top 10 films of 2019. She is a senior MA student at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she, um, her research focuses on various forces uh, affecting indigenous groups in the Southern Philippines. 
and our two guests who are also of the Philippines and we uh, are deeply honored to have them join us in this conversation. Uh, Dr. Padma Perez and L.A. Piluden. L.A. is of Mount Dada, Dada, probably uh, incorrectly pronounced, my apologies, in Bauco in the um, uh, mountain province. As a teacher, she facilitated her heritage-based research in St. Mary's School of Sagada, where she worked with students in community-oriented heritage mapping projects. She writes creatively with the Ubok Cordillera Writers Group, uh, exploring indigenous identity in the Cordillera through fiction and nonfiction. She currently teaches at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, where she is also pursuing a graduate degree in language and linguistics. And what an honor it is to have a teacher and educator think with us uh, in the book. Uh, it is uh, phenomenal. Thanks, uh, LA, for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, Dr. Perez is an anthropologist by training and a writer by heart. Padma received her doctorate from the Faculty of Social Sciences at Leiden University in the Netherlands in 2010, and she is also a graduate of UP Baguio, as I understand. Um, she is the author of Green Entanglements, Nature, Conservation, and Indigenous Peoples' Rights in Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, and Padma is a South Asian editor project lead for the Agama Agenda, a special project of um, the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. You have already heard too much of me and my voice, and now I'm going to turn it to um, Gio Konda. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Before starting, I want to acknowledge and thank the lands that sustain my life and my work, the Jope, Turtle Island, cared by Ho Chunk elders and ancestors, and the Indian Highlands, cared by Kichwa and Kitikara elders. I want to give a special thanks to Luisa Cadena, Delphi Carawa, Elodia Dawa, Laura Santillan, who are the Kichwa women, who are the futures of the story I'll share with you today. What follows are reflections and beats from the chapter called Kitra Stories of Futures, Narratives for Otherwise Good Living, um, which take place in the Ecuadorian Amazon and Highlands. The chapter proposes that futures are stories that have not yet taken place. Those stories come into being through a narrator who reads things co signs collectively produce. And I'm getting signs that uh, my microphone is <laughs> a little bit off, so I'm going to hold it like here, like this, and I apologize. <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> the chapter proposes that futures are stories that have not yet, ta yet taken place. Those stories come into being through a narrator who reads signs collectively produced. The collective is people, understood as runa in Kichwa language. Runa, which can be translated as person or people, describes all beings who are familiar and pertain to the Kichwa life. Trees and animals are also runa when they belong as actors in the world of the Kichwa speaker and are therefore people. The signs used by human storytellers to weave narratives thus might as well be a part of other people's stories. Here I think with the Afro-Caribbean philosopher Sylvia Winter, who, um, who says that human beings are homos narrata, a hybrid, auto-instituting, languaging, storytelling species. She argues that the stories are formative of the possibilities of being and the possibilities of the world we make. The stories can set our sense of self free of oppressive, universalizing and singularizing descriptive statements of, of identity on what it means to be human, um, which are traceable to the Renaissance and informed by social Darwinism. The same is true about time in history. Times can be freed from singularizing progressive time that binds pasts, presents and futures to cause effect chains. 
histories can be freed from stories that dismiss their construction and the multiple possibilities of storytelling that survive, even if, of, if untold. Indigenous stories are a way in which important and untold histories survive and make present many senses of self. The survivance provoked by indigenous stories does weaves presences through multiple selves encountering each other across times in long and short periods. A key trial that Luisa Cadena, for example, said that when this world ends, the earth turns inside out, taking everything that we can see around us underground. And it will be the time of the ancient people to live outside again. In this way, the ancestors, all the people, human and more than human, are part of the renovation of the world and resting features. Simultaneously, they are the weavers of the everyday. The other space of the past that weaves futures in is the forest. The forest is home to trees, to animals, to spirits, to the death, which are overlapping in unstable categories of ancestors living in this age. These ancestors come to give advice, signs, and medicine during the night and in dreams. Elodia Dawa, a Kichwa Pottery Master, explained that to interpret dreams, people often meditate about the dream, then discuss it with family and friends, and finally decide on its meaning. This process often happens during the early hours of the morning, 3 to 5 a.m., because the forest is still awake at that time. Interpreting future signs was a thing to do at the moment when both the grandparents of the present, the community elders, and the grandparents of the past, the death, the trees, and animals made their presence felt to give advice. This advice opens narratives and makes possible descriptive statements to story oneself into the day and which do not attempt to bring the, the future to the present to manage it but rather to listen, interpret, transform, and story a relational self. This way of making good days, good futures, and good lives disrupts bureaucratized notions of good living, which in the last decade in Ecuador have been part of policies and public projects to plan the future of the nation and make a developmentalist good living for all. Thank you. With that, I, I hope you could hear me well. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to um, pass it to Nicole to continue. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Tumong, and it really is quite the privilege to speak to you all uh, today about this book and, and my piece within it, uh, Spirits and Serpents, Buddha's Prosperity in the Snake Temples of Myanmar. Um, this chapter has a special place in my heart because it represents the personal relationships and learning processes uh, that I gained while doing research in Myanmar, which have in turn uh, privileged me so much and allowed me to continue these interests as a teacher and writer working in Myanmar more recently. Uh, as my book chapter draws from research that took place in Myanmar, uh, it is important for me to use my platform and my privilege to draw your attention to both the contents of this chapter as it relates to the thinkers with who I'm so lucky to be published with, as well as the events currently taking place in Myanmar, uh, namely the military coup that began on February 1st and has since violently disrupted the futures, taken the rights and stolen many lives of protesters throughout the country. Um, so I'll begin with the former and transition to the latter so that we as a community uh, can continue to keep those currently experiencing great injustices in Myanmar in our minds and remain hopeful and imagine futures where justice is possible. The ideas in my chapter emerge from a suite of novel Theravada Buddhist temples, uh, Mui Pia, literally meaning snake temples. Uh, these temples are sites of, of Buddhist worship where Burmese pythons live in temple spaces and are regarded as manifestations of nuts or spirits in the Buddhist animist tradition. Uh, the snakes at these sites are guardians of ancient Buddhist treasures or thait, which are imbued with a radiating magical quality that enlivens the landscape and the various animal, human, and spiritual beings that reside upon it. 
Uh, during my interviews with those who worship at these sites, many people explain that they choose to go to these particular sites because they have a thyset or sort of a spiritual connection uh, with the spirits, the snakes, and the landscape. This notion of a thysa is sort of hard to articulate in English, but I would describe it as a oneness or a deep entanglement, or in the central theme of this book, indigenous to the landscape and to the self. And I'll explain my use of the word indigenous a bit later on. Um, though these sites are considered to have ancient origins in the Buddhist discourses and cosmologies surrounding them, they were first installed in the landscape in the late 1980s, uh, a time when there was great political and economic turmoil brought on by the volatility of the Myanmar Yunta, then known as the State Law and Order Restoration Council, State Peace and Development Council, or SLORC, SPDC. And it was during this time where there was also the emergence of a larger, similar suite of Buddhist practices and temples, which religious historian Nicholas Foxius calls prosperity Buddhism which facilitated people to make sense of or cope with ex existential uncertainty, and which I argue that snake temples are a unique subset of, of this particular form of, of Buddhist expression. Having emerged and flourished during a time of great uncertainty, these temples offer followers with the opportunity to take hold over their futures through spiritual means. For example, those who convene with the snakes and the spirits they embody through ritual worship and donation are able to accrue karmic merit such that their futures and their future lives in the process of rebirth can enjoy both materially and religiously desirable outcomes. In other words, displays of religious devotion and connection with the spirits are expected to bring positive returns for the devout. And in my chapter, I detail the various ways that people know the spirits to be indigenous to the land, such as through dreams given by spirits, the sightings of snakes at particular sites and the ways that these notions of Buddhist energy are felt on the landscape and used to justify the making of religious space. I also detail the significance of this notion of having a spiritual relationship to the land at the level of the individual in the creation of identity and the negotiation of a better life or a good life through religious means. And so in conversation with those in this book who discuss the significance of indigeneity and in the politics and sovereignty of colonized people, lands, and ideas, it is important for me to discuss my use of the term indigeneity in the context of Myanmar at the time of my research, which was between 2017 and 2019, um, and how new possibilities of the notion of indigeneity are being created in the current political moment. Uh, the title of this book and other writers in the book use capital I indigenous out of recognition and respect for indigeneity as a powerful and important concept, identity and title for those who have violently had their land and sovereignty taken by historical processes of colonialism, imperialism and capitalism. However, I um, use lowercase indigeneity in my chapter as a more theoretical way that we can think of animals, spirits and multi-species relationships in the Buddhist lens. And I'll read a bit from my chapter to explain why I make this important distinction. Uh, international legal definitions of indigeneity, such as United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, serve to support colonized, underrepresented, and oppressed minority groups in the areas of human rights, cultural rights, and rights to land or territory on the basis of historical attachments to place. Though Myanmar is signatory to the UNDRIP, International concepts of indigeneity are strikingly incongruent with localized meanings of indigeneity within the context of Myanmar. In Myanmar, the term indigenous peoples and ideas of indigeneity have been incorporated into the 2008 national constitution under the term Dayana, literally meaning sons of the land, a category used to refer to ethnic groups which are recognized by the government as belonging to the national races. This analytical utility and ethics of the term indigenous is contested in the case of Myanmar because of the concept um, of indigeneity as it applies to peoples has been used by the state to exclude certain ethnicities such as the Rohingya and justify political violence against those who are not in Myanmar's official list of natural races as well as hierarchies that are considered within the national races. So I read this piece of my chapter um, to show that while indigenous peoples are able to claim indigeneity as a way towards justice and sovereignty in other parts of the world, the notion of indigeneity has been weaponized 
by the state to exclude and even subject those in and out of these different definitions um, to violence. However, in, in light of recent events, I would like to include um, by imagining possible futures for a more inclusive notion of indigeneity made possible by the voices of those in Myanmar throughout the country who are vehemently opposing the military regime. Since the military coup occurred on February 1st, those throughout the country have been protesting the violence and injustices posed by the state. Millions throughout the country have come out to protest. Thousands of civil servants refused to go to work as a way to disempower the military. And even after 50 known civilian deaths have occurred, people still go out day to day. Protesters are calling for the release of detained government leaders, the recognition of the democratically elected government, and the recently formed body of the CRPH made up by many of those elected in the 2020 election. One rather significant and important narrative emerging from protest discourses, especially among youth and ethnic civil society organizations, is calls for a federal democracy in the sense that ethnic minorities, both considered and not officially considered indigenous, to have greater representation in the state going forward. There are also emerging discourses among youth of the Bama ethnic majority in the central cities expressing regret, sympathy, and recognition for the similar forms of violence that have been imposed on ethnic minority groups, including the Kachin, Karen, Rohingya, and others. And I say all this because um, I myself as a Bama American and therefore an outsider to the politics of the country and, and an outsider to the violence being imposed on those within. I have a responsibility to listen to, leverage, and respond to the many different voices that are emerging from within this crisis. And I hope that those of you here today will do so as well. And while from the outside, um, at least for myself, it's been disturbing and angering to watch these atrocities, I maintain that so long as people in the country continue to fight and oppose the military, we in the global and, and the academic community should be in solidarity and do what we can to support human rights and freedoms. And an important part of that is simply hoping for, imagining and anticipating a future for Myanmar where all people are free from state sanctioned violence. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to pass it to Grace. Good morning, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, so I'm the author of the book cha chapter entitled Dreaming of the Futures, an Exploration of the Dreams and Resistance of the Obo Manopo. So I'd, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ho-Chunk people, traditional custodians of the land where I present from today, which is also known as Madison, Wisconsin, in Turtle Island, North America, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge Apo Sandawa, the land of the Obo Manobo people, for sustaining Bai's existence and from which this chapter is situated. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where Bai is on today, Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples, also known as Toronto, Canada. The dreams of Bai and her clan, to which this chapter is informed, command the rules and existence of their being. Through the examination of Bai's narrative, I've proposed that dreaming has reestablished itself as a critical means of knowledge production. Dreaming and dream sharing foster the continuation of Obomanobo ways of knowing and anticipating the future by resisting attempts of erasure by colonial and hegemonic pedagogies. Bai and her clan have used dreams to bring the presence and knowledge of their ancestors to their decision-making process to guide and protect them. So in my conversations with Bai, I learned that dreams are not static, nor is it linear. It does not only inform us about the present, but informs us of the past and the futures. Just like histories, dreams and dreaming are constantly evolving. The dreams gain meaning through attention and they gain meaning for the givers of that attention through careful communal study. Bai's narrative is not just a story of resistance, but of violence through continued erasure, displacement, verbal and physical threats by the national government and private corporations. 
So here I share a piece which I made in 2019, which I believe is indicative of how the Philippine government has perpetuated violence towards indigenous peoples in the country. Ako po si Nanay Nini Bailon. Kami po ang mga dumagat dito, mga hatangkay. Nang matuloy ang dam na ito, 1981, nagtaka na lamang kami na dumating yung mga equipment na iyan. Yung pala, sisimulan na nga itong dam na ito. Sabi namin, paano na kami? Sabi ng hapon sa amin, mas marami daw ang nangangailangan ng tubig sa Maynila kaysa dito sa kabundukan. Siniyasat ko ang kalagayan ng Maynila. Sa tingin ko sa Maynila, hindi kulang sa tubig. Kasi bakit? Bakit nakikita ko doon ang mayayaman? May paligo ang bathtub. Bakit ba yung mayayaman? Maraming tubig. Yung bang mahirap, walang karapatang uminom para mabuhay. Ako po si Tatay Lope. Na ang posisyon ko po ay herder na pinakamatanda sa kanila at sinusunod ng kabataan dito sa Nayon. Nasa kula, uh, kulangan man apat na pong taon o tat, uh, kuwarenta taon na kami ay patuloy yung paglaban na marami na din yung nakitil na buhay para sa amin pero kami ay patuloy pa rin yung pagtutol doon sa itatayo nilang proyekto. Ay gagamitin lamang kami ng mga mayayaman doon sa kanilang proyekto na iyon na hindi naman ang kok para sa amin. Wala ako na pira. Wala akong ginto, wala akong kay anuman. Pero ang malaki na pamana ko sa mga anak ko, apo ko, o apo pa noon, ay ang pong lupa. Ako po si Ginoong Rodrigo Piston, isa po sa kaksaan. Kung kaksaan sa amin ay kategorya ang katutubo. Na ang ibig sabihin ay chiptin o sa salita naman Tagalog. Itong ginagawa namin, hindi lang kaming mga katutubo ang magtatamasa ng tagumpay. Pati mga katagalugan magtatamasa ng tagumpay. Gawa ng unang-una, epektado ang impanta kung sakaling magkaroon ng trahedya ang dam. Pag nabulas ang dam, sino ang lulubog? Ay kami namang mga katutubo ay tatakbo sa bundok. Ay yung impanta, maka saan sila tatakbo? Sa simenteryo. Saga na kaming namumuhay. Pag dumating yung eleksyon, lilitaw ang isyo na dam. Sabi ko, masanay na tayo. Patalastas na lang yan. Diretso ang laban. Diretso ang tanim. Bahay na bahay. Tanim na tanim. O kaya sa ngayon dito, wala kang makikita ang lugar na walang tanim. Talagang lahat ay may tanim. Pag walang matatanda, na magsisimula at magpapakitang may lumaban ang mga bata hindi matututo. Kaya ako ang pananaw ko sa aking pamilya at sa iba pang tao, kung gaano ako maging katapang, ganun din sila. Alang-alang sa hiniras yung bukas. Sana ang lahat na dumagat ay dinggin at madinig kung ano ba talaga yung karapatan nila sa aming lupang ninuno. The government has used the rhetoric of development to legitimate projects which have encroached on indigenous land. As a result, many of these ventures have generated opposition from indigenous communities, sometimes erupting into violent conflicts and bloodshed. So the current Philippine administration has prevented Ba'i from coming home to her people and land. 
she continues to take space by organizing from Canada through her second liners in Mount Apo, who Ba'i trains to be dream literate. Dream literacy in this chapter is defined as the ability to provide sound dream interpretations through constant dream sharing and communal interpretation. She continues to raise awareness about her people and land through dialogue with Filipinos and Filipino Canadians in Toronto. Despite all the violence she's experienced, Ba'i persists. Today, Ba'i continues to dream and pay attention to her dreams despite being 8,000 miles away from her people and land. Ba'i relies on her dreams to help her make sense of her situation and her new role as a leader in exile. She continues to share and interpret her dreams with her family, second liners and Obomanobo leaders and elders who continue to listen. So my aim for this chapter is to present a decolonized perspective on Ba'i's history by exploring the ways her clan records and transmits memory and knowledge through Ba'i's dreams and its interpretation. Ultimately, it is to give readers a more diverse look at what powerful resistance looks like. It is humble, it is persistent, and it is female. Ba'i also frequently interprets her dream through poetry. One, one of her poems entitled Silence speaks to the feeling of separation she feels from her community. Here lies a silence, she says, that crept into my flesh. To break that silence, her spirit separates from her body and returns to the land where she was born. Silence in a consciousness unwritten, almost unspoken in this part of the West. Thus, here my body hides, but my spirit soars or strives. My body and spirit breaks into vast distance in time as I watch the winter skies. As my spirit returned to villages, hearing indigenous cries. Every day my heart departs, embrace you all in my past, though engulfed with silence to the fight I pay with full reverence for a just peace in our land. So thank you so much for everyone's time. Now I'm more than honored to introduce L.A. Puludin to officially launch the book. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so this is, I will be providing a sort of response, a reaction to this uh, book. Uh, I would like to thank Lihia, Grace, uh, Gio, and Nicole for those chapters. Um, definitely there was fascination and familiarity and uh, always a very, uh, always a learning moment um, in the book. Um, and so my reaction is, uh, forgive me, it's going to be a sort of unrefined meandering of sorts. And um, uh, allow me first to digress into memory. Um, so I will just read what I have prepared here. Um, so five years ago, I moved away from the city to teach in a small school in Sagada, Mountain Province. Uh, in Sagada, the classroom was, in the standard terminology of pedagogic practice, uh, culturally homogeneous. 99% um, of the class spoke Kankanae, and the students there are assertive when it comes to their tongue. They will say, the teacher from the city must learn how to speak like us. And so I did. The, the students also grew up learning the indigenous ethics of Inayan, and so I must learn this also. So I share this anecdote because between me and my students, there emerged a sort of co-learning. And in order for co-learnings to take place, humility is expected for everyone involved. Uh, when I transplanted myself there, it was my students who taught me how to navigate the landscape, uh, understand the weight of its spaces as much as they did. I remember 18-year-old Audrey saying to me, without land, there is no culture to be built. She understood that culture was not just something to be acquired, but something to be created, as long as there was land or a space to build it in. I also remember 17-year-old Deborah saying, in the future, we, the youth, today will be the elders of the community. And that is an acknowledgement of our responsibility, a future that is self-determined, and I also remember another student, Aaron, 
who is notorious for disappearing from his class. Uh, one day, he did appear in class and he turned in an essay entitled Thoughts on Culture and Progress, where he wrote in the first paragraph, every place is dynamic, where nothing will last forever. Someday things will not be as they have always been. Everything changes and it will continue to change in the future. How would this affect the people, the culture and the place itself? What would Sagada look like decades from now? End quote. So I mentioned Audrey, Deborah, and Aaron because as I was engaging with the book, my mind kept going back to these former students. And for them, the future of their community was always part of the conversation. Um, wondering about the futures of their land and of their heritage was already in their vocabulary. And contrary to the common notion that the youth of today have little regard for their heritage, the young people I met in Sagada are thoughtful of the futures yet to come for their community, their dap'ai, their tawid, their ways of seeing, and perhaps especially more so with indigenous youth, they do reflect the, on the continuity, the ongoingness of their memories far into the future. Um, it is the indigenous youth who are intentional in pursuing what Gio writes in her chapter, an ancestral objective. Uh, on the other hand, I recall what a, a former student from Kalinga once said to me, masyadong elder-centric, uh, but this is uh, uh, an intergenerational tension uh, exacerbated by social media and technology. And it's definitely a site of encounter where new negotiations and new accommodations will, will be made, leading to more spaces and more futures. Um, Joanne Ray, in her chapter about Goana walking, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Goana walking, and the metropolis as uh, indigenous space, uh, wrote, uh, sustainable futures involve and most urgently impact the young people. And it is the young people who are currently carrying the burden of consciousness for the well-being of the planet and future generations of humanity. Um, this burden of consciousness is the dreaming and the place-making impulse that I believe young people already have and carry with them as a result of collective storying, ritual, intergenerational dialogue, and coexistence with other than humans. However, the current climate of our schooling system has not supported or nurtured this impulse yet. And I will emphasize the yet because it will soon happen in the future. Um, rather, it has uh, taken the side of, uh, the schooling system has taken the side of the linear monologic of capitalist development. And in this development, uh, there is no room for a multiplicity of futures. And rather, in this current education system, storytelling is neither privileged as knowledge nor competency. An official from our Department of Education would even blame storytelling for the low standardized testing scores of Filipino students in math and science. This official would rather have students become less exposed to stories and more engaged with procedural language and technical exposition. In other words, the language of treaties and the language of dispossession. Um, we acknowledge that um, our school system has made some strides to be more inclusive in our educational practices, such as the institutionalizing of indigenous education, jargonized as IPED. Um, but even our local brand of IPED has come to reflect the consumerist visions of a culture industry that does not visualize beyond the material, the pageantry, the tokenism, uh, it is an iPad that is still preoccupied with exhibits, bulletin boards, remnants of somatology in the preoccupation over indigenous appearances, and even sentence examples in basic learning modules in the name of contextualization, where the discourse of indigenous is employed for decorative value. Um, as we speak, educators right now are required to satisfy checklists that remind them of indigenous education contextualization. So um, the, 
I don't know if there are any teachers in the audience, but just imagine your school supervisors whispering over your shoulder, contextualize, contextualize. Um, but yeah, but uh, even but well-meaning teachers, even well-meaning teachers make attempts to incorporate indigenous elements into their learning materials. Um, but sadly, often there is a resulting misrepresentation or misinformation. And such misrepresentations result from a racialized, a highly ethnicized version of ourselves. Again, leftovers from the colonial anthropological, anthropological somatology. Uh, they still have traces in our public school textbooks, textbooks that informed generations of indigenous people, especially in the Cordillera, that they are a more inferior race because they came in the wrong wave of migration. And how does one go about excising these narratives? The indigenous is so over-researched and yet so misunderstood. Uh, Mile Arvin echoes this, indigenous people are simultaneously overperformed and made invisible. Um, we are surrounded by performance, over-performances of the indigenous. Um, Jan Hare, Christine Bridge, and Amber Schilling in their chapter, A Forward Echo Pedagogies. Uh, their chapter is entitled Preparing Teachers Through Land Education. Um, I will admit as an educator, this was the title that, that really uh, struck me. Um, in this chapter, they re-examine the university and how its campus spaces are confronted with the relationship with indigenous people. They are concerned with, and I quote, the colonizing approaches that seek to understand and analyze how the physical and material aspects of higher educational settings serve not only serve not only to expose colonial practices, but also reveal possibilities for much needed social transformation, end quote. Through an institution's use of space and structure, we also ask ourselves self-reflexively, how is indigenous presence demonstrated in our spaces? Are we complicit in normalizing Eurocentric knowledge traditions? The Ojibwe writer David Troyer once wrote about the paradoxes of indigenous peoples, quote, silent displays and very loud silences. And um, that's why I believe knowledge resources like this book, uh, Indigenous Futures and Learnings, are so important. These are important projects in providing educators such as myself a sort of starting point. Uh, a program or what uh, Lihia said, uh, um, signposts perhaps, uh, visions, possible directions, collaborative ontologies and uh, futures for our curriculum. And um, I hope it does not diminish the value of the book when I admit that I read the book as a sort of manual for the colonial teachings and learnings but definitely the book is more than that. It's, it's, it's not just a commentary on pedagogic practice, but also the explorations into more ecological and spiritual ontologies. Um, I see ecologies being confronted in Joanne Ray's Goana Walking. Um, I dream of the reorienting powers in the language of Roberta Hill's uh, Haudenosaunee. I, I hope I pronounced that right, Haudenosaunee, a Thanksgiving address whose potency I very much believe can be likened to the secular poetic forms found in Sagada, like the Dai'un. I begin to understand survivance in the dream literacy of the Obomanobo people. Uh, the dream is to escape from mere ethno. Indigenous studies does not stop at ethnographia. Uh, it takes the strength of threads, mm, co-productions with the land other than uh, co-productions with the land, co-productions with other than human. Uh, we are homos narata, as Gio had said earlier, uh, traversing two knowledges, a plurality of futures and learnings. And outside the province of social science, the indigenous often find their agency in production springing from literary or aesthetic spaces. A poetry, art, children's stories, protest song, place making, and the reclamations of spaces in the Ili, in the metropolis, or as Gio wrote, the in-between where stories thicken. 
Um, it takes the strength of threads, like Maria Jacinta's uh, principle of coexisting. Uh, there is no other way but third spaces. And uh, I'm about to end, but you know, that's all. I, what I see is, I see in the book a validation of the processes of braiding and weaving that we who are indigenous so often dream about in our quest for more decolonized spaces and futures. So I think that's about it. That's my raw response um, to the this wonderful book. Uh, thank you again, Lihia, Grace, uh, Gio, and Nicole. Thank you. I think Dr. Padma is next. Thank you, LA. I want to start by saying that I have nothing to add. <laughs> and I mean this both seriously and both as um, a, a bit, a moment of lightness. And the seriousness comes from recognizing that it's time that we put uh, indigenous voices first and recognizing that I am speaking as someone with a thoroughly colonized uh, past um, and history. And um, it's a difficult position from which to speak and the times and the book that we are launching today, this wonderful special book we are launching today, invites us to another space and practice of reflexivity. Those of us who cannot claim um, indigenous descent or indigenous heritage because of our colonial history. Um, and I, I confess that it opened up many uncomfortable questions for me, and that was a good thing to, to happen. This needs to happen. And many more scholars in academe need to be in those spaces of discomfort um, as well, because here in Philippine contexts, there have been already too many conferences, too many panels, too many events where people speak, non-Indigenous scholars speak about the Indigenous with an authoritative voice. Um, even the most well-meaning, even those that are very active, who are activists and allies, uh, with the indigenous will recognize that too many times those of us who are not indigenous have been invited to speak when there are indigenous leaders, teachers, educators, scholars, writers, dreamers, elders who are far more capable of occupying these spaces and taking up um, this time. So I'm grateful that the book Indigenous Futures and Learnings Taking Place invites us to reflect on that and invites a recognition that there is so much more work to be done. If it's difficult, as one organizer told me um, in the past it, on another panel, if it's difficult to find an indigenous person to come and participate in these spaces um, or an indigenous leader, it's only an indication of how much more work needs to be done to open up these spaces and to really widen the participation. Um, so with that, I'll turn to a little bit um, on what I experienced reading this book. And I wonder if anyone here today has ever used the word pleasure or joy to describe their experience reading an academic publication. Um, <laughs> Because if you have, you're special. There's something special about you. If you have used the words pleasure or joy to describe um, your experience reading an academic book. Um, of course, we've all encountered texts that inspire, excite, and provoke new trajectories of thought. Um, and we all have had, I think, that moment of feeling thrilled by an idea um, that we've read in an academic book. But more often not, than not, the phrase, a joy to read, is reserved for poetry and fiction, not for academic books. Full stop. Indigenous futures 
was a joy to read, but indigenous futures are not a fiction, full stop. Here is a book that makes this as clear as spring water that you can drink at the source. Unfortunately, we live in a time when there is too much turbulence in the water, too much movement keep kicking up mud so we can't see with clarity, too much effluence seeping into the earth so we can't drink without swallowing toxins. Here is an academic book that is a joy to read. And for me, the profound pleasure I felt in the pages of indigenous futures and learnings taking place came from reading chapters in which the pronoun was we and not they. I cannot describe enough the power of encountering that on the page. It's, um, and I just hope for more of this. And if LA, if your response to the book was raw, mine is still to be picked from the tree, far more raw than your beautiful response to the book. I have a story about we and they, and it brings me back to another book and another book launch uh, happening in a very different time and space. In 2016, Mount Cloud Bookshop ho hosted the launch of a book entitled Indigenous Earth Wisdom. Like this book, the editors were all women um, and the editors were of indigenous descent. And um, the book was a collection of stories and memories of what it meant to be indigenous with the earth and with space and with ancestral domain. So there were memories of time spent with grandparents, memories of how children were raised and admonitions to care for the earth, never take too much, um, don't be disrespectful of animals and plants and trees. And at the launch, um, present were Auntie Vicky Makai, she's an Ibaloy elder, um, Manang Lucy Ruiz, who is of Kalinga descent, and Maria Elena Regpala, who um, has Ifugao heritage as well. So all women of the Cordillera. And they told these stories and described how we, the indigenous, do this, we, the indigenous, do that. And this question popped up in my mind and I think it was a, an impertinent one and it was bordering on um, dangerous and it could have been dis taken as disrespectful as well. And I was very aware of that. And my voice was shaking when I asked it. And to this day, I'm not sure what compelled me to ask the question when I knew that it was potentially disrespectful. It, to be very honest and very candid with all of you here today, the question came from a feeling of, um, of, see, it's still hard for me, and that was six years ago that I've been thinking, carrying that story around in my head and grappling with it. But I think it came from this feeling of being so completely lost, of not having any connection to the wisdom that was being described and not having any connection to the practices that were being um, described. Um, so perhaps what I was experiencing was, was my complete colonization. Um, by our history and by our circumstance. Maybe, I, I don't know. So I asked, but who can be indigenous? Um, can you become indigenous? And I, my voice was really shaking when I asked this. It was a very small audience, non-academic, very intimate gathering in the crowded small space of the bookshop. And I got three very different responses from the three editors. Auntie Vicky Makai was adamant. She was like, no, you cannot become indigenous. You have to be born indigenous. Only if your parents are indigenous and you have indigenous blood and indigenous heritage and you have an ancestral domain, only then can you be indigenous by birth. 
Uh, Manang Lucy, she said, well, we have rituals where you can be adopted. Somebody who is non-Indigenous can be recognized and accepted by the community as Indigenous. But you would have to embrace our way of life and you would have to reflect our culture and our values in yourself and the way you live. And you cannot ask to be adopted. Um, this ritual would have to be offered to you or um, you would be invited to become part of the community. You cannot say that you please um, adopt me or please be part of your community. It's something that has to come from the community. And then um, Len, Maria Elena Regpala, she, she was silent for a while and she was staring off into the distance and we were all waiting. And she, after a while she said, I, I think there's a way where you can be indigenous by thinking like an indigenous person. She was very tentative, like she was putting this forward as questions as well. Or by behaving like you're indigenous to a place. Um, maybe indigenous is also a way of being in the world and it's not just an identity. I was struck by these three responses that I received. I think they were all true. I don't think I, any one of them was wrong. I don't think they contradicted each other either. They were all truths. And the reason I bring up this story is because not just because it's a story about we and they, and I as, a, as um, an academician as well as an academic um, of someone who struggled often with writing about them, quote unquote, um, and the feeling of, of discomfort, but also the need for great care, putting great care into how we use the pronouns they um, and them in describing something that's not ours. Um, so I apologize for this very raw and very honest um, kind of reflexivity this morning, but I think that it's called for and indigenous futures and learnings taking place, um, races that challenge to, to everyone. We need more, more books like this, where we read we in the pages, um, us, ours, and we need to be able to encounter these writings and these experiences and these dreams and stories differently as well. There's something more that's being asked of those of us who are non-Indigenous than to listen. That's not enough. Nicole has said as much. It's not enough to just listen and to just witness. So what I'm acknowledging this morning is the challenge that this book puts in. It's a, it's, I love what LA said. She read it like a manual. And so I, I already anticipate the way this is opening up so many other futures for young educators and young scholars and young academics. But I'm also excitedly anticipating the way this book is going to compel non-Indigenous scholars to rethink their scholarship and their writing um, and how they position themselves as allies of the Indigenous. And it certainly gave me great pleasure to read the chapters, some chapters of the book that I was able to read, but it also compelled me to ask more questions, questions that I hadn't asked before of myself as a um, anthropologist. And of course, 
we know of the colonial heritage of anthropology and what that has meant for us also in the Philippines. And many scholars, many other anthropologists, I would acknowledge, have tried to, um, to dissociate the practice of anthropology with the colonial past, not without acknowledging that we had that colonial past in our anthropological training, but also we need to ask ourselves how our practice of anthropology today may still be perpetuating colonial points of view and colonial practices and how can we move away from that. So with that, I want to say thank you so much to the authors and editors for birthing this book, for allowing me this space um, to respond to the book and for putting the book out there, for making sure that it exists. Because another thing that this book does is it carves out more ancestral space. By publishing our ideas, our knowledge and our thoughts, we are staking out ancestral domains for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Perez, for that. And um, that was wonderful. And thank you to our panelists and our guests as well. Now, uh, it's time to take questions from our audience. I'm sure that uh, we all gained a lot of insights that we'd like to um, clarify on. So um, you please write down your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom and on the chat box on the YouTube live, live stream. And I will be reading it to our panel. So uh, from our Q&A box, um, Jay De Los Reyes asks or says that this has been an inspiring launch. Thanks, Licho, Nicole Gio, LA, and Palma for these great thoughts. I just recently got a closer look into the world of our algorithms, filter bubbles, and echo chambers. I understand that they existed prior to new media, such as in textbooks, policy, etc. But I was wondering, how these digital insulators or, or sort of noise canceling technologies are shaping, transforming, and uh, challenging learning and teachings on, off, and with indigenous peoples. And how do you respond to these much bigger regimes so that we can make the conversation happen at the very least and sustaining it, hopefully? So if anybody wants to answer this, so his question is on um echo chambers filter bubbles um algorithms and so on in teaching indigenous peoples does anyone want to do that it does, we need a little bit of time Okay, uh, all right, so I'll read the rest of the questions, maybe, and then we'll give you time afterwards to respond. So, okay, so uh, a few other questions. So, to Nicole, you speak of positionality. How do you negotiate or manage your privileges vis-a-vis -vis the people you write about or represent in your scholarship? To Gioconda, you shared fascinating Indigenous ideas about time. How to how do these ideas fare in contemporary time when indigenous peoples need to deal with other sort of dominant ideas of time? And to Grace, in your filmmaking practice, documenting the struggles of indigenous peoples, how do you situate yourself in the conditions that they experience and or the issues that they fight for? Okay. Yeah, thank you for that question about positionality because I think um, that's really important and I think my process has been imperfect, but I think um, the first step for me was sort of addressing um, and acknowledging my own positionality within myself, um, being able to identify the points of privilege and leverage that I've had um, through being um, educated in the United States, having these sort of perceived um, qualifications of knowledge and, and hierarchies um, and then also being to be op being able to be open about with um, with people that I do research with, um, being able to call out the points of identities that perhaps are shared. For example, the research I do in Myanmar, at least in this chapter, was with um, primarily Bama Buddhists, 
um, and being able to say, I myself share in that identity through my upbringing, but also recognizing that um, I have a lot to learn and that this is not my identity in the way that it's experienced by those who I do research with. And then I guess in my writing, trying to do justice to the histories and knowledges of the people that I do research with and telling them as they are told to me rather than you know, filtering them through a lens of sort of like folk or other types of knowledge that perhaps aren't regarded in the same way that the typical forms of knowledge that are spoken about in these Western um, institutions of higher education are. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. How about um, for Grace or Gyokonda, perhaps, or as a as an answer to the question in our Q and A? I could try to start um, to answer the one directly to me. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a very important question to ask, oh, because it is very very important to ask whenever we're talking about indigeneity because indigenous ways of thinking about time and knowledge and everything tends to be situated in the past like tends not discursively to be situated in the past mm, as if it's not something that is currently being used that is being grappling with changes during hundreds of years. Um, and sorry, and adapting to all the pressures, the tensions, the um, the violence as well of of different um, yeah pressures, right? Or ways of governing and like just the straight up theft of labor of lands and so on and 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 yet indigenous people continue to think in their in their in their ways and know in knowing in their particular ways and and think about time and find the find spaces and practices to keep being and to and to continue their their presences um, and 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 in talking with with Kichwa people in the Amazon, um, there was interesting. For example, the idea of dreaming and how um, the people of the past will come in dreams. And sometimes these dreams were about the forest, but sometimes they were about a car crash. And like how this was an omen for something that was going to happen that day. And I remember uh, going to the Yasuni forest uh, with 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 a friend Pedro, who who use is a very biodiverse and very um, a protected forest. And just remembering and you know hearing together the birds and so on and, and he's been saying like this is how it used to be when I was a kid but now it's, it's changing and I was I was asking like do you think it would be nice to you know to stay here longer to live around this forest and he was like well it's really hard the life in the forest too and I would like my kids to have have it easier than I had it. and and so but that didn't mean that he his way of thinking about the forest and about his values and about um, how to think about time because sometimes thinking about time is disrupting that linearity is just about like how through relationships um, things can happen differently can happen at the same time, can happen not just in one way, um, which is how normally we record history, for example, and things like that. And also in the city, in the capital city in Ecuador, there's this little school that I also talk about in the book, um, where an indigenous uh, woman, a teacher, um, talks with the kids at school who are also indigenous um, 
students about two knowledges and how to weave um, the the calendar that is driven by by the earth and by the plant, the, the the planting corn and different things with um, learning maths and learning sciences and like and learning also geometry how are we planting this and like where's the sun shape and all these things and so i think there's ways in which um indigenous people have been and are and will continue to understand their time in their own ways um always responding always responding to the present and dreaming and 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 projecting themselves into into what is to come and yeah yeah, well, thank, yeah. thank you you uh, and great perhaps so um i'll just i'll just read the question again um so in your filmmaking prop pra practice documenting the struggles of indigenous peoples how do you situate yourself in the conditions they experience and or the issues that they fight for so i must admit that i'm not of indigenous descent but i'm very honored to be a channel and an indigenous ally so i've used filmmaking as a medium in the same way so for example um, in the previous film that i've made i spent eight years in the aita community in zambales and I made sure that I'm not acting as someone dictating and projecting my own advocacies and activism. Um, so uh, in the whole process, in the whole eight years that I was in the community, I was always in conversation with the, the Aita elders and the Aita uh, leaders, and also Augustine, who was the main, main the protagonist in the uh, documentary that I made. Um, in the same way with with the Dumagats, the short clip that you guys were able to see, um, it was in, intended for the Dumagat community. So I made that initially to be shown within the community and not outside. It was later on that um, they realized that it could be something to, to you know, raise awareness about their plight. Um, the, the intention of that film was to successfully, uh, to to communicate to the younger Dumagat, uh, Dumagat activists that the elders were able to successfully resist um, the dam projects which infiltrated their community and that it encouraged them that they too could you know, be successful in their resistance if they choose. Um, so really I, I see and use film as a medium um, to bridge issues and concerns within the community and I, as much as possible I try to I try to you know raise a raise awareness and become aware that I'm not dictating or projecting my own activism of course there would be um, that in my in the films that I do and how I use the medium but just being aware of you know how how sometimes you can infuse your own um, activism is is a very important um, part of the process also. Thank you, Grace. All right. Does um, anybody want to take a jab at Jay's question about algorithms, filter bubbles, and echo chambers in relation to shaping and transforming uh, learnings and teachings on off with Indigenous peoples? I can say uh, just a, a couple of, of things um, that may or may not be um, helpful in, in uh, thinking with Jay's complex question. Um, so I wonder if it would be possible to um, think of algorithms in this 21st century and as uh, sort of Jay is thinking about this, them as sort of these bigger regimes. Um, I, I wonder if it might be possible to think about uh, or think with um, the black geography that is the plantation and the um, thinking of uh, the plantation itself as in many ways, the algorithms that are sort of uh, ruling in, in, in many ways, what we are able to, to imagine and to labor with and to, and to feel and to um, uh, uh, 
draw and create joy out of. And so perhaps to think about um, what kinds of practices um, the enslaved peoples uh, in uh, plantations, and uh, plantations are not uh, a thing of the past. Um, they're sort of a, a structure that continues uh, in, in, in complex ways uh, in our current times. But if, if we do think about um, the, the earlier forms of, 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 of plantocracies, um, what kinds of practices did um, the Maroons engage in, or people that sort of became Maroons engage in to subvert um, the system, to, to look at a, at a site where, where people are creating forms of resistance. That might be an interesting way to think about how it is that uh, we might be seeing indigenous people um, or um, how um, people that are sort of engaged and, and, uh, and and concern with indigenous matters, how they might be sort of subverting uh, the, the, the kinds of synergies and energies that might not be, and my connection is a bit unstable, that might not be um, uh, in, in a way able to assert themselves, but that, that, that there are ways in which people can interrupt um, how, how they're uh, uh, meant to be uh, ruling and producing uh, uh, constrained forms of existence. Um, I, I think uh, to, to, um, to think with Jay, the, the, kinds of, the kinds of responses that we might find won't be through algorithms. It would be through being in place in the geographies with people, very much the kind of work that you, Jay, are already doing uh, would be a, a way in which we can get to, to see how people are um, subverting uh, the regimes. Thanks for the question. All right, and with that, Licho, I think you can uh, tide us over to our closing. Thank you. Um, I just uh, frankly want to say, uh, uh, how uh, appreciative we all are uh, of you, LA, and of Patman at the time that you've invested in engaging with the work and uh, inviting people to think with it. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the UP Baguio uh, for uh, creating the platform, uh, to Ruth, to Paula, to um, to uh, Jose or uh, um, Kim for uh, uh, the uh, uh, support behind the scenes, uh, really for, for making it all happen. And to all of you who are here um, for um, taking the time for engaging with the work. Um, if you are at an institution, please get your library to uh, request the book, to purchase the book for um, access to, the, the, um, to you and to your, uh, all the people that you're working with and uh, reach out to us. Uh, we're here, we're willing to continue the conversation with you uh, also offline if, um, if you're um, happy for us to continue doing that. And, and again, just um, really uh, thank you for, for the interest and, um, and for wanting to with us uh, world life otherwise. Thank you. All right. So once again, uh, the book that we discussed was uh, Indigenous. Uh, Indigenous Futures Lear and Learnings Taken Place, published by Routledge in 2020. This book is available in hardback and ebook formats from routledge.com. So thank you very much for that enlightening discussion on future dreams and learnings and for your book itself. It, it was an honor and a gift to be able to foster the discussion. So thank you, everyone. Um, if you have more questions, you can send us e an email. Uh, you can send us your comments and then we'll tied it over to our um, authors. So thank you.